morning. It's good to see you all. And as we enter into the second panel, I do want to let you know that John Bateman, who was supposed to be here, had a family emergency that he let us know about this morning, and fortunately, he can't join us. I will go ahead and introduce the other two panelists, give some introductory remarks, and then we'll be off and on our way in the discussion. Um, I'll introduce to my immediate left, Bruce Klingner, who has been a voice that I've known of for quite a while in regards to North Korea matters. And he is a sane and solid and uh, really a great contributor in that space. Uh, and he's uh, done so as a senior research fellow for Northeast Asia at the Heritage Foundation's Asian Studies Center. He was previously in the CIA and the Defense Intelligence Agency for two decades. And so he brings that experience with him as well. From 96 to 2001, he was the CIA's Deputy Division Chief for Korea, responsible for the analysis of political, military, economic, and leadership issues for the President of the United States and other senior U.S. policymakers. He's testified in a number of congressional uh, hearings. He's uh, been out and about in the media, uh, adding to the knowledge that our public can have on this matter. He is a graduate of the National War College, uh, as well as uh, the Defense Intelligence College and Millbury College in Vermont. Um, if we uh, ever have any sort of physical attack, he has a third degree black belt in Taekwondo and a first degree black belt in Hapkido and uh, another martial art. Uh, they live in Silver Spring, Maryland. Uh, he has three children, and including a son from the U.S. Marine Corps. And two grandchildren. Two grandchildren, too. All right. <laughs> I've yet to hear of a grandparent uh, dislike being a grandparent. So, in fact, I think one grandparent said to me, best thing my kids ever did for me was to give me grandchildren. <laughs> Tom Wing Wingfield is our other panelist for today. He holds both the JD and LLM from Georgetown University Law Center and a bachelor's in history uh, from Georgia State. Uh, he has a whole range of uh, research, uh, scholarly sorts of positions. Uh, it would take a long time to list them all. I'll hit a few of the highlights and some of the more interesting uh, ones. He was a professor of international law at the George C. Marshall European Center for Security Studies in Germany. He was also a professor of law and strategy at the National Defense College of the UAE uh, in Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates. Um, currently, he's a senior international defense researcher uh, since July 2021 with the RAND Corporation. Um, and he, in terms of his governmental service, he served as a DAS uh, in, uh, in the Pentagon uh, in the cyber policy realm. Um, previously. So um, there are many other interesting stops that he had in his very uh, his illustrious background, uh, but I think those uh, will suffice uh, at the present time. Let me give some introductory remarks. North Korea has a cyber army made up of multiple thousands of uh, cyber warriors, if you will. They have engaged in all manner of attacks, whether it was the WannaCry ransomware, whether it was the Banco Delta in Macau, whether it is uh, stealing funds from South Korean banks and engaging in array of attacks on South Korea, whether it was the attack on Sony after the uh, movie that they objected to so much uh, the interview came out. Uh, this is something that they have engaged in. And it is very asymmetrical because they have very little to defend inside of North Korea. They don't have the extensive uh, cyber infrastructure that exists in countries like ours. And so that being the case, they've been able to stay on offense generally. 
And those of us who speak out in the North Korea space uh, are familiar in one form or another of their cyber attacks upon us as well. Uh, I remember a cyber attack that happened on my Facebook account and uh, it really didn't do much, um, but uh, I think they wanted to remind me that I was on their radar or something uh, to that effect. And so uh, North Korea does not allow the bulk of the populace to even access external internet. They have an intranet system where they, um, which they tightly control. Uh, but this, the implications of what North Korea does does not only affect countries like South Korea and the United States. Um, when North Korea was trying to uh, build up and give the materials for the Syrian nuclear program, there was an interception of cyber information that led to the Israeli Air Force bombing the Syrian nuclear reactor out of existence. And so as a proliferator, as one that engages in cyber activities around the world, it is beyond just the narrow scope of one might, what one might think would be the range of their attacks. China has also been uh, a player in this cyber space as well. Um, TikTok, for example, National Security Advisor O'Brien indicated that the Chinese Communist Party can use TikTok to pinpoint the location of Americans who have uh, gotten into TikTok. And if you are a member of the military or if you are a member of the intelligence community, God forbid, you could have your coordinates identified by the Chinese Communist Party in, in ways that uh, you may not want. Um, when there was a lot of talk about Russian interference in elections in this country, apparently I've heard from experts far deeper into Russian activities along these lines than I am, that this has been going on as a matter of course for a long time, that Russia has been constantly seeking to interfere in our elections, that it is nothing new. It is something that they regularly and constantly and persistently engage in. And so we have a triad of countries that we are going to be focusing on, North Korea, China, and Russia. And we have a deep well of expertise to draw from uh, on our panel here. And so I will start first with Ruth Klingner and then, uh, and then uh, move on to Tom Winfield after that. And then uh, after you both have had a chance to share your initial thoughts, then perhaps we can have, have some interaction and then also some opportunity for uh, questions from you all as well. Ruth. Well, uh, first of all, thank you very much for the, the very kind introduction, but unfortunately, in introductory remarks kind of already stole a lot of my thunder. So <laughs> I'll, I'll try to fill in a few of the blanks uh, as much as I can. Uh, and, I, and I do look forward to, to questions at the end. And uh, you know, when, when in the intro, you talked about my testifying. I remember probably the most memorable thing I remember during the testimony was when I was still at CIA and I was appearing before the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, and intelligence is the key word here. Uh, we're about 45 minutes into a briefing, highly classified, we were all brilliant and analytic. After about 45 minutes, a congressman interrupted me. Excuse me, son, which is the bad one, North or South Korea? <laughs> a few remarks, you know, replies came to mind, but remembering where our funding came from. <laughs> And that would be the North Star. Okay, so you can continue. So, anyway, that's sort of the bar I, I've had for, for questions. Um, the North Korean nuclear missile threats are very well known. They, they get publicized, they're very tangible. Um, but North Korea's cyber prowess is much less known, although to, to Korea watchers, it, it's become very well known. Um, there's often kind of this perception of North Korea as being very technologically backward, and they couldn't possibly do things that are so complicated like cyber or nuclear weapons. So people often think, well, they must have gotten the nuclear weapons from China or Russia. No, they're indigenous. 
Um, and I remember doing interviews during the 2014 Sony Act, um, and inevitably, you know, the, they put the photo, the nighttime photo of Northeast Asia, you know, up on the screen behind me. And you can see the lights blazing in South Korea and China and Japan, and it's all dark in North Korea. And I'm like, look, these guys can't even keep the lights on. How can they do something like a cyber attack? So, well, yes, they have thousands of cyber warriors, and they're very good at it. Um, Kim Jong-un has declared that cyber warfare is a magic weapon and an all-purpose sword uh, that guarantees the North Korean People's Army, you know, ruthless striking capability along with their nuclear and missile programs. Um, and North Korea has been, you know, assessed by South Korean and U.S. intelligence as in the top four cyber threats to the world. Uh, and U.S. officials have said it is a grave threat to international peace and stability. And it's also a grave threat to the stability of the international financial system. So they are very good at it. Um, and they have successfully penetrated very highly sensitive uh, military computer systems in the US, South Korea, uh, financial systems, uh, infrastructure systems, kind of the list goes on and on. Uh, civilian nuclear reactor uh, computer systems, et cetera. So um, they, they've gotten into uh, U.S. Forces Korea computer systems. They've gotten at least part of our war plan, which is a response to a North Korean invasion. Uh, they've gotten into South Korean uh, defense contractors and stolen parts of, of blueprints. Um, they've also done, as you mentioned, ransomware. Uh, we're sort of a nice computer system. You got here, shame if it were to break. Uh, you didn't give us some, some cash. Um, and they've also retaliated against people that they thought were insulting the, the regime. So the Sony hack was because of this uh, movie, the interview, which was seen uh, as a threat to North Korea. Uh, and North Korea had demanded that the US government prevent this movie from being released. And they threatened 9-11 style attacks on any movie theater that showed it. And then they ended up not showing it in theaters, they released it online instead. Uh, and that even led to uh, two other projects being shelved. BBC was going to do a series, uh, a drama series about North Korea. They pulled that. Uh, Steve Carroll was going to be in a, a comedy about North Korea. The studio canceled that out of, out of fear of retaliation. So when I looked on North Korea's side for a big paper I did a couple of years ago, it seemed that it, it broke down into six phases. And, and you know, by starting phase two, it didn't mean they stopped phase one. But they seemed to progress. So the first phase was sort of these cyber espionage to steal information, particularly military, um, where they sort of disrupted, destructive attacks against uh, who they saw as their, uh, their opponents to destabilize the systems. Um, and they were also getting into media and, and infrastructure and other systems. Um, the phase two was sort of cyber terrorism, revenge attacks, extortion. Phase three was cyber bank robbery. Uh, and the most famous or the earliest case was when they got into the Central Bank of Bangladesh and they stole $81 million and they would have gotten away with another 850 million if someone hadn't noticed a typo. And what they did as they often do is what's called social engineering. They approached a, an employee of the bank. They're like, hey, we think you'd be a really good addition to our bank or our company. They engaged with them. They had LinkedIn uh, profiles. They did some interviews. And then by the fifth or sixth email, you know, please click on this malicious uh, link. <clears throat> so they got in his computer. And then over 18 months, they got deeper and deeper into the Bank of Bangladesh's uh, computer system. And then when they what they did is on a three-day weekend in Bangladesh and a three-day weekend in the U.S., they struck. And they even were uh, figured out that the, the the standard operating procedure for the bank uh, was they would print out, you know, every transaction that happened. Well, they turned off the printer. And so when the bank employees came in after a three-day weekend, they're like, you know, why is there no stack of paper? And they've got into it, figured out, oh my God, you know, there's the bank robberies. Uh, they call in New York. Well, it's a three-day weekend here. And so the, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York approved at least five of these transactions. And, and that sort of set the tone. And what they found was that um, they, the, the cyber crime were much uh, you know, less risky, much more lucrative uh, than their traditional crimes of, of counterfeit 
currency, counterfeiting, pharmaceuticals, drug smuggling, et cetera. Um, and then as sort of the banks got better at protection, then they moved to phase four, which is cryptocurrency. And then, which is even more lucrative, uh, phase five was these alternative uh, currencies or decentralized financial sites. And then phase six was uh, pharmaceuticals. They were going after Pfizer and others to try to get uh, COVID vaccines. So they continue to do this. And uh, as I said, it's sort of um, a more efficient way of doing crime. And so they've stolen billions of dollars, uh, particularly in cryptocurrency. Uh, they are estimated to account for more than 50% of the total losses arise, arriving, arising globally from cryptocurrency hacks. Um, by 2019, they'd already stolen $2 billion in cryptocurrency. Last year, they stole $1.7 billion in cryptocurrency. And just to uh, put that into perspective, um, their total legitimate international trade was $1.5 billion. And their crime, their cyber crime was $1.7 billion. So it's just kind of amazing uh, how they've done that. And the US government has said during the last two years, North Korea has largely funded its nuclear <coughs> missile programs from its cyber uh, attacks, uh, its cryptocurrency attacks. Uh, and just to give a sense of sort of how they accumulate so much money, um, just some of the big hits they've had, they had a $500 million hit against a, a Japanese firm called CoinCheck, um, $250 million in digital currency from a uh, digital currency exchange. Uh, and then uh, I think it was last year, $620 million uh, from a, a network called Ronin. And that is still the largest crypto heist in the world today. Um, so, you know, all of this is very, very worrisome of, of the things that they have done. But even more scary is what if they did it all at once in a, in a crisis of war or leading up to a war, where if they started going after not only stealing military secrets, but if they get into infrastructures, power grids, oil pipeline distribution. Um, the South Korean intelligence has warned that they've gotten into computer systems which control the speed of trains in South Korea. Uh, they've also uh, messed around with the GPS of airliners flying into Seoul's airports. Um, you know, what if they were to do all of that at once during a crisis? Um, so people worry that it not only would impede military operations, but also infrastructure, civilian infrastructure, um, and also uh, either lead to massive theft in the cyber systems or people losing faith in the international financial network, where people might say, you know, I, we, we can't do things digitally because we don't know if it's not all North Korea. So, you know, kind of leaving with that very scary negative view, uh, sort of the light is that in the last couple of years, governments have become much more aware, the financial uh, networks and systems have become much more aware, and there's a greater networking between uh, the US government and other governments, particularly South Korea and Japan, uh, and also amongst the finan financial networks and the government with the financial networks. So, um, and also because of the improved relations recently between South Korea and Japan, we're now seeing trilateral cooperation on a number of issues, military, economic, et cetera. Uh, and they're just now beginning some trilateral uh, crypto or cyber working groups in the three countries. So that's all to the good, but uh, it is a very, very worrisome North Korean cyber threat to go along with their nuclear and missile threat. Thank you, Bruce. Tom. Um, I've always wondered what I would say if I had access to senior diplomats, well, how could I dis distill my decades of doing cybery things into just a few clear, important things I hope could be carried forward? Here are the three things. Um, first of all, uh, even most defense and intelligence policymakers don't have a very clear idea of the nature of the cyber domain in that by its very nature, it doesn't allow for analogies from either conventional military actions or from nuclear deterrence world. It is a third way of looking at things that we need to come up with. 
Uh, there's a wonderful new book out called Cyber Persistence Theory uh, by Fisher, Keller, Goldman, and Martinet. Uh, they were three in-house scholars at Cybercom. So in addition to being brilliant academics, they also had tickets to see every operational thing that was happening over a period of years. So even when they write unclassified material, there's nothing in it that would conflict with what's really going on in the world. And their main point is that unlike what you might see in TV and movies, cyber warfare is not fingers on the keyboard, dramatic movements on a screen, and someone else in Pyongyang or in Shanghai or in St. Petersburg is dueling with them in cyberspace. It's much more like a medieval yeah. duel of miners trying to get underneath a castle. You may never in encounter a, a member of the other force, but with an ever-changing domain of cyberspace, once you build a tunnel, tunnels can move, tunnels can collapse, tunnels can appear on their own. And you're always tunneling in order to be able to get at things that matter most. You're always tunneling to make sure that no one's tunneling against you. You are always out there building advantage, seizing initiative with cyber persistence theory. So this is something that goes on all the time and the main effort is in peacetime. Now, in wartime, are there some great glass options of some pretty scary things that one side could do to the other as a one-time thing? I would assume there are, but most of the fight is during peacetime, which is getting those accesses, securing the accesses, finding other accesses, and digging those tunnels is by far the more complicated part of the equation. What you put at the end of it, whatever rootkit or tool or weapon or Trojan horse or worm, is really very secondary and very off the shelf and straightforward. The getting there and the finding other ways to get there and stay there, that's the magic. And so that evanescence is not as simple as digging a tunnel to the one thing we want, and then in wartime, we know we can shut down that system. Um, it's, it's much more continuous in peacetime. That's the first thing. Uh, I would commend you to Fisher Keller et al. because they have a very clear, well-documented, short explanation of these things. And I would not release any senior official into the cyber world without at least spending a couple of hours looking at that to orient her mind to where we really are and, and that would put you ahead of many other thinkers in the space. That's the first thing. The second thing is cyberspace by its very nature is the most international global domain there is. Uh, even moving from one domestic place to another, you're going into space. Uh, perhaps you're going through a friendly country. Perhaps you're going through a not so friendly country. The way we have divided up cyberspace between blue, us, red, the bad guys, and gray, everybody else in between is a helpful theoretical construct. But what it really is, is a blur from darkish grayish red to grayish blue and back again. And even the simplest actions in cyberspace may traverse most, if not all, of that spectrum back and forth. And we have billions and billions of those happening every minute. So the idea of this, the globalness of the, the domain means we just can't put up castle walls at our cyber borders and let the rest fend for themselves. It is not even a nice idea or good policy or good politics. It is absolutely necessary that we work with our allies and partners to be able to build them up. Okay, to do what? Well, at the very highest level, we can have a handful of partners, and I'm talking a single digit number of countries that we can fly missions within cyberspace. They are so capable, we can go anywhere and do anything, and we can trust them as a wingman in doing global cyber offensive operations. They have the skills, they have the people, and there's the level of trust between us where we can do these things together. That's a very small number. The next level down is, and I don't mean this pejoratively, is the JV. Our countries that are very capable, but they're not quite big enough, they're not quite advanced enough. We're not quite, we don't have the back and forth to just 
have the absolute open attitude we do with five eyes and our closest allies. And those countries, and that's perhaps another 10 to 20, probably closer to 10, will, with concerted effort over the course of this decade, be able to fly missions with us. But even before they do that, we can trust them to do the domestic part of a global mission in their, in their country. Now, we won't use any country names, but we can imagine an Asian or a European ally or partner, not a large country, but fairly wealthy, fairly um, technical. And even though they're not comfortable for a variety of reasons, going around the world and doing things with cyber black bag jobs, we can count on them to have visibility of their own banks, their own systems, the embassies that are around tracking things in their own borders. So that second level, we can trust for, for those things in the, 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 the static defense. Then beneath that, we have countries that we really can't work with in real time, but they're starting to defend themselves in a threat realistic way. That is, they just don't have walls set up. Rather, they have, um, they're seeing what the enemy is doing and they can move defenses to make sure that enemy is not successful right the heck now. They're able to do this, do that. So they have a very agile defense that is able to monitor threats, often with tipping information from more capable friends and uh, partners and allies, um, but they're able to have a very active, agile defense. The next layer down from that is more static defense. We make sure that we have all the cyber hygiene in place for our people, cyber hygiene in place for our enterprises, that the castle walls have no obvious holes or obvious tunnels going under them, static threat agnostic defenses. A good place to start, but not sufficient if the most capable adversaries come after you. And then at the very bottom are the, are the countries, I'm not gonna use any countries' names, I promise, that, um, as we're making friends with, with small Pacific Island nations that we have ignored for too long, as we're making friends with them again for obvious reasons, uh, we have to explain why their National Security Council can't keep meeting down at the Starbucks because, direct quote, well, the Wi-Fi is better there. <laughs> um, you don't have to be... <laughs> By, by some of the laugh right here, you don't have to be a cyber expert to understand what's wrong with that picture. So we have to work with countries. Now, here's the good thing. We don't need to pull them from one side to the other. It's a very asymmetrical problem that benefits us in two ways. One, our main adversaries don't have a lot of allies and partners. They have a few client regimes and a few countries that depend on them for one reason or another. We have a much broader, deeper, richer network of allies, partners, and I go so far as to use the word friends, um, that comes from decades of diplomacy, aid, and uh, genuine trust built up over years and years and years. That's a huge asymmetrical benefit for us. The second is that any, any increase going from one of those levels to the next level up, from National Security Council meetings at Starbucks up to good static defenses, or from good static defenses up to good agile defenses or up to good domestic offensive work or international, moving any country up one level benefits us asymmetrically because it makes the adversaries, we're doing the criminal things we just heard about, it's like having floodlights on the front lawn so you can see the, the burglars coming in. So that effort, even if it's not tailored to give us access to their networks or tailored to keep out those particular bad actors, just raising the transparency and raising their ability to manage their own cyberspace, that is a win-win um, for the networked world. Um, I will say there's one last thing, if I can have just two more minutes, is that okay? Please. For my third and final thing, and I say the last one that I think is the most important one for last. Even most really capable cyber leaders, um, when I was in the Pentagon, believe it or not, even as a DAS, I was the senior most official in the Pentagon that did cyber full-time for policy. That's at the three-star level. That was as high as it was in the Pentagon. Now, I had a really smart, really capable assistant secretary, 
but he had um, border, immigration, uh, nuclear, and two or three other cats and dogs. So he was brilliant, but he had no real cyber expertise and he had this much bandwidth for it. So when we tried to explain these threats, I finally wrote an article with a colleague, Brett Michael. It's in IEEE Computer. It's called Waterfall. And it is unclassified, but it lays out the thing I would most like to lay out for senior diplomats and policymakers. And that is, God forbid, there's some kind of world war at the end of the decade with China. If they decide to come against Taiwan, it may not look the way we were expecting. And the reason I say that is we had always expected that if something happened, we would mobilize and deploy as quickly as possible. We would transit as quickly as possible. We would get to our pre-positioned equipment and facilities as quickly as possible. We would engage the enemy as quickly as possible. And if we did all of that right, we would probably win. And that was our plan all along. So knowing that, the Chinese came up with a different way of looking at things. Phase one would not even, it's even before that, attacks on critical infrastructure, not even intended to bring down critical infrastructure, but I call them three to five Hurricane Katrinas that are selective pieces of damage done to certain areas of a racial density, of a political party dominance, um, of wherever the fault lines are that can be exacerbated, um, pulling, doing these attacks in order to delay a president's decision to commit to, to go 72 hours, 96 hours. They only need to buy a few days in each phase. And it would not be that the damage done would be secondary to the political bandwidth that would be, that would be just consumed by that. So they hope to buy a few days with that. Second is the mobilization and deployment. We used to assume the whole land was a sanctuary, not so much anymore. So we cannot count on rail going where we want. We cannot count on trucking not being confused. We cannot count on the 80% of large cranes in Los Angeles and San Diego um, that are able to move huge amounts of cargo, the 80% that are owned and managed by Chinese companies. We can't count on those working the way they do in peacetime. So the mobilization and deployment could also be slowed down by three or four or five days. That's added on to phase one. And then when going across, we used to go to safe ports and just build up an iron mountain of, of weapons. Well, without even attacking our ships or planes, the Chinese could set up a barrier, perhaps at the second island chain, that would um, make navigation ineffective, that would make communications inoperative, that would make networking between our platforms, which is our special sauce for the 21st century. It's what puts us 10 years ahead of the second best military in the world. Uh, that would go away. And with all of those things there, they would create a here there be dragons area that we would be very careful going into because we would lose most of our advantage and they wouldn't have to sink a single ship or shoot down a single aircraft to do that. So we might have to build up certain capabilities before we felt comfortable going into that. Then phase four, going past the first island chain, that would look like victory at sea. That's World War II in the Pacific. That would be awful, but it'd be a Tom Clancy movie. Um, it'd be directed at weapons, directed at platforms. The fifth and final phase is the worst one, and we had not contemplated this one a Chinese decision maker who is irrevocably committed to doing this. That is a leader who is either going to win or be dragged into the courtyard and shot by his, his people is going to be committed to moving forward. Given that pathological decision making, uh, if they are losing, the playbook says that a strategic option should be presented to the leader. Now, in the last century, that was a degree of small nuclear options for a demonstration, something to shock to pause, or something to escalate to de-escalate. Uh, the Russians wrote the book on that, but the Chinese have read the book. So if that's the case, uh, a decision maker may say, you know, uh, a maximum leader, we're very sorry, but the invasion's not working out as well as we had hoped. The Americans are better than we thought, and they have more friends than we thought and their friends are better than we thought. 
If that's the case, they would say, all right, what's the status quo anti bellum? And they might have a nuclear option for that. But someone could come forward from the strategic support force and say, no, 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 no. We have a cyber option and we can kill any number of Americans you want as if it were a nuclear strike by shutting down critical infrastructure or by doing certain things that we can have the equivalent strategic effect without the Hiroshima or Nagasaki moment, without the fear of the knee-jerk nuclear response built up over the last 70 years, uh, without the, the radiation, and we would have our fingers on the dimmer switch. They're not listening, you can make it a little bit worse. They seem to be coming to the table, you can dial it down to encourage them to keep coming to the table. Now, I'm not saying whether or not such capabilities exist. I'm not being coy when I say that we may not know. These are big, complex, even chaotic systems. So anyone who's saying that you want to kill 9,400 Americans in Los Angeles County, just press this button. That's probably not an accurate way to look at it. But if it's presented to a, a leader who has been backed into a corner, he may look at that cyber capability as a more attractive option, or at least as a more attractive first step before going to the nuclear backup that was in mind since the last century. So if that's the case, we can imagine, again, going against uh, civilian targets in the United States in order to kill enough people quickly enough uh, to shock us and the idea from the adversary would be to bring us to the table very quickly. So in closing, the last thing I will say is when you're thinking about what World War III in the Pacific could look like, remember that of those five phases, three of them were in the United States and three of them were directed primarily against civilians. So the importance of having DOD and DHS and CISA and state and treasury and justice, having us work together to figure out our authorities, to, to gain some things, to get better at that unexpected piece of warfare, I think that will be absolutely critical that we transcend some of our pipelines. So thank you for your attention for that long, short summary, and I look forward to our discussion, especially your questions. Thank you. I'm interested to hear what could be done more specifically in terms of increasing American preparedness, and for the U.S. to be able to counter the things that are happening and could happen in the future. We uh, look forward to hearing from both of you on that. I just want to sort of pick up on the castle analogy. Um, I just see seeing it's like overwhelming the challenges to having a good defense. Because, you know, and also the, the intangibility of cyber. Uh, I'm not a cyber expert. I'm a, a Korea-Japan expert. Uh, I'm finding I'm becoming my father when it comes to technology. My, my VCR doesn't blink 12, 12, 12, but I sort of turn to my children and I'm like, what is this streaming of which you speak? You know, so, um, and, and so it makes it harder than sort of the, you know, there's a tank, how good is the tank? You know, I got an anti-tank missile or missile defense. So those things people can understand. But when it comes to cyber, it's sort of like the slippery eel. With, with a castle, you can have very tall walls, very thick walls, uh, you know, lookouts up there. And all it takes is, you know, the, the cook to forget to lock the back door after he brings the garbage out and the bad guy sneaks in. Or your, your castle isn't locked up every day. You have traders coming in, you know, commerce every day, people coming in. Some of them are bad. And so when you think of all it takes is sort of one we link, but one you know bank employee who thinks he wants to you know he wants to get a better job, he clicks on the link, you know, and you think kind of what idiots would fall for these things? Well, you know, yes, yours truly, uh, you know, all of the Korea watchers we exchange stories <coughs> of either unsuccessful or successful hits. You know, I had North Korea impersonate a classmate of mine from the National War College. Uh, and they knew he sends out a Christmas card letter every year to uh, those of us in, in our homeroom or committee 10. And it was like, you know, hey, you know, Bubba's, it's Ernie. Uh, sorry it took so long to get the Christmas card letter out. Hope everyone's doing fine. You know, all the best, Ernie. And they had changed the, you know, his Gmail address by one digit. I clicked on it. My screen goes white. Bring it to the IT. And they said, oh, 
your, your account has had activity in China and South Korea, it's, it's North Korea. So any of us have any number of stories. So it just makes it seem more that how can you defend against that? And when you think we can put in all these systems of, you know, defending the American financial system, well, we, you know, the government or the banks or a company interacts with, you know, some company in small, you know, nation who doesn't have the protections. And that's where they can target and then get into your very heavily defended castle. So it really shows the enormity of the task of trying to have an airtight defenses. So you need to not only educate you know, your own employees, or the U.S. government, U.S. banks, U.S. companies, but all, you know, almost the world of all the ones that we deal with. So you really need a lot of interaction but, but between the governments, the financial systems, the companies, and then sort of vertically of trying to do that. And, um, you know, it, it's more, that's more highlighting the challenges rather than the solutions. Um, you know, just first of all, absolutely. I hit the nail on the head with some of the challenges up front. As far as what we can do about it, um, just one or two quick ideas. Uh, from the technical end of the spectrum, obviously our internet was not built with security in mind. It was built with professors exchanging information and it was built to have, you know, reliable, fail safe communications after a nuclear war where the messages would disassemble themselves, each find different ways in the remaining infrastructure to get to where they had to go and then reassemble themselves. It was just this marvelous system for what it was designed to do, but it was not designed for security. So we have been putting more and more packings on a, a sucking chest wound for decades. So obviously building a new, better, secure internet and then integrating that with the legacy internet, that is the, the moonshot of what we should be doing over the next decade or two. As far as what we have now, you'll hear people talking about zero trust. The idea that there's not just one gate at the, at, to have a protracted metaphor, at the castle gate, not just one guard there, uh, checking to make sure people are good or not, because there are lots of ways to get past that. But instead to have a guard at the entrance of every building inside the castle and to have a clerk at the entrance of every room inside each building, double checking uh, credentials and making sure people were who they said they were. Now that's not foolproof, but it's a better defense in depth. Now there are a lot of problems with doing that because you have to know what kind of hardware you have, you have to know what kind of software you have, and most enterprises can't even tell you what is being, what's been plugged in and what's running on it. But in theory, it's a good approach. Um, then the, the last thing I would say is, as far as the other end, how to respond to it, um, without giving any research away from the Rand Corporation, where I live now, uh, from various war games, we've had one consistent surprise. And it's consistent enough that we're no longer allowed to be surprised at it. When we put real live decision makers from the departments and agencies together for a war game of what if these cyber things happen to us, um, attacking infrastructure in the run up to something worse, something like the five phases I discussed earlier. Um, as we see that, we thought, okay, the FBI will know what to do there. Um, Spacecom will move satellites around. Uh, Northcom will liaise with civilian domestic authorities. We, you know, everyone will do his thing and it will work out. That's not the case. When you put these people into rooms, in separate rooms, the first question is, well, what are we allowed to do? I mean, we generally know the kinds of things we could do, but where we are in the threat spectrum or where we are in decision-making, are we allowed to do this now? Can we do that now? Can we do that? They don't know what they're allowed to do. They don't know what thresholds they decide or what thresholds someone else has to decide before they can start doing that. And they really don't know the authorities of the departments and agencies in the adjacent operational space. Uh, is the FBI gonna take charge? Does Homeland Security have teams to do this kind of thing so we can be doing that kind of thing? Um, it's just a paragraph of clarity for each organization. So talk about your low hanging fruit, educating them so when they walk in, they go, okay, until the president tells us otherwise, we can do this, 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 and this, but that, that, and that are off, are off the books. And as far as what we can expect, 
you know, this agency will do this, that agency will not do that. And you can at least start where they're doing the things they need to do. So that would be a great thing to do over the next year or two to identify those gaps and overlaps, educate the people to what the standards are. And then if there's still gaps and overlaps, then you go back to the president for executive order. Then you go to Congress for some statutory relief to try to, to shave off the rough edges. So by the end of the decade, we keep hearing people talk about the end of the decade. By the time we get there, we'll be in a marginally better shape than we would have been had we just kept whistling past the graveyard. Tom, is that happening right now, or is that something you're proposing should it be happening? At the very beginning of it is happening in two or three different war games, some classified, some not. Um, that light bulb has gone on um, at the four-star level and at the cabinet level. And no one is opposed to that. I mean, everyone wants to do the right thing. It's just, it's a big, complicated machine. So the awareness part of that, I would say mostly yes. As far as coming up with authoritative clarity for each stage, that next step has not, or would I love to do that at Rand Corporation? And then as far as the next step after that, once we gain that out a lot, um, seeing where the gaps and overlaps are, knowing what we can fix in the next few years, uh, that would be the next step that obviously has not happened yet. We have uh, a group of leaders here who have done amazing things and continue to do amazing things. So I want to turn it over to you all in terms of questions you may have that you'd like to ask the panel here. Is the North still the bad one? The thing was, it's, it's the congressman who asked, I, I can't remember who the name, but I do remember he was from the South and I'm from the North. And I felt like saying, Unlike the Civil War, the North is the bad one. This <laughs> time. Oh. Thank you for your funding. Thank you for your funding. I, I have two, two short questions. One, you know, we're always the good guys, and it's not in our DNA to be provocative. We always react one way or another. And my question is, how much bandwidth are we spending on just being assholes by going after all of these actors without provocation and stealing their money back and wrecking their infrastructure to keep them on their heel and to keep them busy, um, as opposed to always reacting. When we know that if we do nothing, they're going to do something and then we're going to have to react to it anyway. So that's the first part. And the second part is it seems like if elevating the JV or even the farm team uh, or helps immensely, it seems like a very small investment to gain an enormous advantage. And <coughs> are the people with the checkbook aware of this so that that's where money is spent? Those are my two. On, on offense, I've been out of government for quite some time, so the answer is I don't know. But you can see, you know, sort of the famous uh, story of, you know, that the U.S., went after Iranian centrifuges and, and you know, from through cyber got the centrifuges to spin so much that it, they were wrecked. Um, there have been times when the North Korean intranet or internet went down. People wonder if it was us. And we always, you know, whenever North Korea does something, we're always like, why did, why did they do that now? Well, when the internet went down in, in North Korea, was it like, oh, was that in response to something that was going on? We don't know. So I would hope NSA and others are looking at offense operations. Um, on financially, there have been instances where, especially with cryptocurrency, that the either governments or companies are able to claw back some of the money. So there was, a, I think, a $250 million cyber heist, and the company said they were able to get $205 million of it back before it was cashed out. So... Uh, you know, there are ways of trying to get the money back if it, when it's stolen, because it sort of takes time for it to get laundered through and then convert it into real currency. Um, and then militarily, they're, they're a smaller target because less of their stuff is connected to the, to the world internet. Um, but 
you know, I certainly hope we have folks that are looking into what can we do. There's also, uh, there was reporting several years ago about U.S. left of launch options with North Korea, that we were trying to mess up uh, their missiles or even in their in sort of inserting errors when the missiles were being produced so that when they were finally launched, they would fail. Um, some blamed a number of the North Korean missile launches a few years ago on left of launch operations. We don't know the answers, but I, I just, I would hope we're doing things, but I don't know. Um, as far as the, the offense, um, in a focused way, there are teams dedicated to each of the five major adversaries, um, violent extremist organizations, North Korea, Iran, China, Russia, uh, and they are focused 24 seven all the time on tracking the major national security threats. That's from the cyber comm area. Uh, the first problem is really there are three ways to come in at this. One is the military, which is looking at a smaller list of targets um, as we just heard, and they have a higher threshold for the kinds of things they're, they're worried about and what they would do in response. Then there's the intelligence community, which wants to have all of these accesses, but with an eye toward always keeping everything open. They don't want to find the one malefactor at the end of the trace and then shut down that malefactor. They want to see what malefactors that malefactor is talking to. So that's a different ethic of keeping all options and all paths open as much as possible. And then finally, there's law enforcement, which is much smaller, and it is geared toward finding someone who engaged in a particular crime and shutting them down. Now, there are successes in all of those areas. Do we combine those three well enough? We do not. Um, and then as far as uh, crypto and other things, uh, there are ways, uh, just at the unclass level, I read an, uh, an Economist article about this, that it's possible to create a Bitcoin purse and then fool someone who stole something and putting it into a purse, then locking it, they'll never be able to get it back. So there are ways of doing that, but there are very retail ways. The last thing I'll say is the most important thing is on that is that um, always being out there all the time, if you're starting the search, if you're starting your defense after the actor happens, you're doomed. But if you're out there like a policeman walking a beat and you know who's supposed to be there, who's not, you've got informants, you know where the trouble areas, where they aren't. If you've got that ethic, then you've got a really good chance of seeing it before it gets bad or shutting it down. First question as far as the cybersecurity cooperation, honestly, God, I limit this to one minute. This, this makes my head explode. I spent most of my career doing educational and security cooperation things. And now I'm looking at cybersecurity cooperation. I've done it for, in my last three jobs. And it is very inexpensive. It is very easy to do. And we are just not doing it. There's no coordinated approach to doing it. We don't do good assessments. There's no organization for it. And the last thing I'll say about that is that when it comes to cyber, um, let's just say for um, uh, indo paycom most important um, uh, back command right now for the future. Uh, when it came to cyber uh, security cooperation, there are a lot of things up at the policy and strategy level and others at the operational and, and tactical level. There are things that are very technical and things that are very non-technical. Do they have the authorities? Do they have law? Do they have acquisition, budgeting, this, that, training system for enlisted troopers, education for officers. There's a whole tapestry of things that have to happen for any one program to be sustainable. We have not been looking at those things. The one example I'll give you is for Indo-PACOM, there was a GS-13 in the J-65. And for those of you who don't speak, will speak. The J-65 are the IT bubbles. And they gave it to a GS-13 IT bubble to figure out what Thailand and Indonesia and Vietnam needed. And he said, well, I've got this software that I could just send them all. So I assume that's what they want. And that was, that's what, what we did for those three different relationships and different levels of sophistication. So we're really not looking at it in a holistic way. And we're not looking at it in a strategic or political way first before giving it over to, to you're a lawyer, teach them how to do the laws. You're a professor, help set up their war college with a cyber program. You're the IT bubble. This is the little box where you should be playing, not deciding national policy. I'll mention just a few things, uh, building off of what Bruce was saying. 
Uh, the New York Times reported when there were a number of failed North Korean missile launches towards the end of the Obama administration uh, that apparently there had been some cyber uh, components that uh, had failed in terms of those missile launches. Uh, of course, the administration neither confirmed nor denied uh, action along those lines. Uh, second thing I'll mention is that uh, Silicon Valley, where I grew up, has an annual Hack North Korea Day. <laughs> and they actually go after North Korea on an annual basis uh, from Silicon Valley. Uh, the last thing I'll just mention quickly is when my Facebook had been hacked into by North Korea via a Southeast Asian country, that uh, I don't know if you realize this, I didn't when, uh, when that happened, but somebody who knew a lot more about these things than I did told me, do you know how they figure out how to get into your uh, website? It's actually a process of just guessing. <laughs> and they try this, doesn't work. They try that, doesn't work. And so that being the case, if you have particularly sensitive sites to protect, use unusual or hard to guess sorts of passwords and that will be a simple fix, I was told. And since that time, when I did change my password in that way, they have not succeeded yet in rehacking into my Facebook account. Or so you don't say. As far as I know. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions from you all? Uh, in just about one minute, I'm gonna ask uh, uh, Bruce what Korea is trying to achieve. But uh, to follow up on what I said in the last panel, uh, what I learned in my post was about hybrid warfare, which means that warfare takes more than just kinetic, it's economic, it's disinformation, it's cyber, it's all those things at the same time. And I get the feeling sometimes that our government and our society thinks about these cyber things almost like Halloween pranks. Or, gee, this, that we're going to have a day where we're going to have some fun with the North Koreans on a day. Uh, that, you know, this is kind of unimportant jokester stuff, but it really isn't. The enemy is attacking us all the time, that's what you all say. Korea is attacking, North Korea is attacking us all the time. So my question to you, Bruce, is why are they doing this? Why? I mean, North Korea can't take on the United States. They can't take on Japan. Why? What if, is it just preservation of their regime, their criminal regime? But it seems awfully offensive. What are they trying to do? Well, right now, a large portion of their cyber activities are making money, uh, and that's funding the nuclear missile program. So as they're sanctioned, although the U.S. and other nations have never fully enforced our own laws, let alone U.N. resolutions, um, you know, they are under sanctions, which makes it harder for them to get gadgetry and technology and money. So in the past, they were doing it through counterfeiting our currency, you know, the hundred dollar bill was counterfeited by North Korea, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You know, smuggling of ivory and all these other things, uh, insurance scams. With cyber, it's a lot more, you know, a lot more lucrative. So some of it is to get money for the regime for whether it's directly to the new missile programs or just to offset you know, the money that they can't get because of the sanctions. Um, also, they've gotten military technology, they've gotten our war plans, you know, and it's also preparing for a potential conflict. So the same kind of question can be applied, you know, why do they have nuclear weapons? You know, they say it's to deter us. We never attacked them when they didn't have nuclear weapons. You know, so, but it's, they have a plan to occupy the peninsula whether they will ever use it or not, they want that capability. So they have said that cyber is one of their, you know, lanes of the road when it comes to military operations, along with kind of the more traditional missile tank, you know, art the ground, et cetera. So it's to provide them military capabilities, it's to gain military information, it's to uh, threaten to coerce opponents. Uh, so the same with nuclear weapons, you know, it's like, well, if they ever use them, it's the end of the regime. But what they might do is try to coerce Japan and South Korea, like, look, you don't want a bad day to happen. Maybe you want to give me what I want. Otherwise, we go 
to the to the nuclear option or a cyber option. And if you have you know some administrations might be like, you know, yeah, it's better than having a really bad day. So I think it along with their nuclear missile capability, cyber gives them not only all of those sort of offensive or potentially offensive or coercive um, means, but it's also a great way to make money. I'll just add to that. They've had three persistent goals to get the U.S. uncommitted and uninvolved in the peninsula, to promote uh, positive sentiment towards North Korea and South Korea, and to take over the peninsula by force. Those have been their longstanding, persistent objectives. The biggest deterrence has been the U.S. commitment to defend South Korea. Uh, they have the fourth largest military, not the most high tech, but the fourth largest military. And along the lines of what Bruce was saying, that if they were to invade South Korea in a sort of blitzkrieg, if you will, and then they said, US don't get involved. If you get involved, LA is toast. New York is toast. Chicago is toast because we're gonna nuke them. Um, is that gonna provide enough hesitation on the US part to not defend South Korea? and allow them to keep the now blitzkrieg South Korea uh, that has uh, been taken over by, North, by the world. Tom, you, you paint a pretty scary picture of sort of how a cyber attack could be used at the beginning of a conflict. I was wondering if you could compare and contrast the cyber offensive capabilities of China, Russia, you know, Iran, maybe North Korea as well. And also, so are they all capable of doing such amazing things or is one stronger than the other? And obviously not knowing what exactly they may or may not be able to do, but you know, in general, what you understand. And then secondly, is there any coordination between any of them on cyber offensive activities? Um, that's, that's excellent. We, um, at a classified level, there's much less coordination on cyber between adversaries than we would think. Uh, maybe they don't trust each other, maybe we don't know, but there's less than one would assume, which is good news for us. Uh, the second thing is, it depends what you mean by capability. As far as the ability to have effect X, then they are all very much near the same level of being able to do certain types of things. Where it really breaks down is how many of those they can do. Um, the North Koreans can do a very a single digit number of things that are very serious, but only a single digit. And then we move, move up through the Iranians to the Russians, to the Chinese, to us. Um, General Nakasone was asked that question and he said, the Chinese have grown the most and the fastest, but we are still um, ahead by all the, the measures that really matter. Um, so uh, the, the, uh, the two things I would leave for you are two analogies that have stuck around because they're really good analogies. Uh, one is uh, Russia is a drunk with a knife and China is a chess player with a revolver. And that's a really good way to think of the, the two countries. <laughs> the other thing is when it comes to stealth, uh, without using any US acronyms, when it comes to stealth, uh, the joke that has persistence because it's true is uh, you wanna know how stealthy our adversaries are. Just imagine they were burglars. When you come home to your house um, and every, the door is kicked in, the windows are broken, all the furniture is torn up, there's painting on the walls, um, everything is destroyed. Well, that was an Iranian burglar. Uh, if, you, if you come in and, and uh, your China cabinet has been knocked over and the best pieces were taken out, well, that's North Korea. Um, if, it's, if you come in and uh, just a few things um, uh, have been, you can tell everything has been gone through, but nothing has been really destroyed. They were obviously looking for something. They didn't care who knew it. That's China. When it came to Russia, if you get home and one lamp is one inch to the left of where it used to be, that's Russia. They can be very stealthy when they want to. And if you go home and everything is exactly the way you left it, you know the United States has been there. <laughs> On the, on, on the coordination, you know, with, with North Korea, there's sort of less coordination than many people think. So on cyber, the North Korean government that is, has been in uh, 
interaction with Russian criminal groups, uh, particularly on the, the cyber crime. But North Korea also went after uh, Russian missile factories and was stealing information from them. So, you know, there's a tendency when it comes to North Korea, again, thinking, oh, these guys can't figure this stuff out on their own, that they must be in cahoots with the people, whether it's cyber or nuclear or missile. It's largely indigenous. Now, they, they do have access to others. They, they rely on others for technology and things. But it's not Beijing or, or Moscow giving them stuff. It may be, oh, you know, the, the former Soviet nuclear engineers who were after, out of a job. Well, they hired them and, and they provided some assistance, but not necessarily Moscow saying, here, here it is. It's kind of 5,000 years of, of Korean history of 1,000 invasions by their neighbors. Uh, they don't trust anybody. And their nuclear program started in the early 60s, late 50s, because they didn't trust either the Soviet Union or China. You know, they saw that Soviet Union sold out, out Cuba in the Cuban Missile Crisis. So we can't trust the Soviet Union. And China wouldn't share nuclear information from their 1964 nuclear tests. So we can't trust China. So they, they built it basically indigenously. So, um, yeah, a lot of North Korean uh, cyber warriors are in China. Uh, they probably got, you know, educated in Chinese you know, universities or government agencies and stuff, but it's not as much of the kind of the James Bond, all the criminals sitting around as, you know, number one strokes the white cat and saying, okay, number two, you do this, you do that. It's, you know, it's sort of maybe the, you know, the five families, mafia families in New York, they're all in it for themselves. They interact to some degree, but they're all not necessarily under, you know, one rule. The nuclear centrifuge technology uh, that North Korea obtained from Pakistan. And so think H.J. Klaad, not Russia or China. Uh, and that was a trade uh, that North Korea made for intermediate range ballistic missile technology that Pakistan wanted. 